Good morning, church. It's so good to um, see all of you every every Sabbath, and especially the Sabbath we um, to see Ronald and his family. And um, we're very happy you guys are here with us, and um, happy to see how much you've grown. And your dad looks very proud <laughs> to have you guys there. So we're very grateful for that. And um, this songs. Uh, Last Sabbath, I was a little bit overwhelmed, and I'll tell you a little about why I'm preaching today, but um, Rosie knew that I was supposed to play piano today, too. So the fourth Sabbath gets a little hectic, usually for our family, and um, she offered to step in and do the music, and it's like God really used her to minister to me because last night was one of the opportunities I had to really uh, work on the sermon and I, I saw it going a certain direction and I was a little overwhelmed with that and um, she called like right when I'm you know like recognizing that I you know where I'm going and I'm just feeling a little nervous and um, she said I have a closing song to end with and Miss Sharon's going to sing it for us today and it was just like God used her to reaffirm me that I'm, in, I'm doing the right thing I'm on the right track and that God was um, leading me here. And then I, I sit here in the pew this morning, and um, my family, or my, David got a call from my mom's cousin this morning with um, some tragic news about um, his nephew, my mom's second cousin. Um, he passed yesterday, and it was not a good um, circumstance. And so I just kind of was feeling a little overwhelmed this morning, and I'm sitting here like I don't, you know, I mean, I, I, I like listening to sermons a lot more than giving them. And so, um, I, but I'm sitting there, and that medley was all my favorite hymns. Like, I just need that recorded so that I could play it back to myself. I mean, those are the most assuring hymns that we can sing. And, and I remember things through music, you know, those, those melodies and those words. And those are the reassurances, standing on the promises and leaning on him and on Christ the solid rock we stand. These are the things that we need to remind ourselves of every day. So, like I said, I like listen to, thank you, Rosie, because God used you to speak to me at least, and, and that meant a lot. I like listening to sermons. I don't like giving them, and that's not, and God, please, you know, I, I'm grateful that he's willing to use me. But very often, ser- sermons speak to me. I sit in um, these pews, usually, and the messages that we hear from Pastor Andre and Bridget and the people who are regularly preaching, they have so often convicted me of areas in my life that I need daily prayer, that I need the Holy Spirit to come in and help me with. And I've now learned that the only thing more convicting than receiving a message that convicts a specific area of my life is delivering a sermon that convicts myself. So usually, I've, I've preached, I think, here twice, and usually there's a crazy story about why it is that I am preaching. This time, because um, usually that's what it takes, by the way, for me to preach, is that David's too hectic to do it. So he's like, please, and then I do it. Anyway, um, this time he just made this deal with me. There's a lot of negotiating in our house. And he said, I'll, I'll give two sermons if you give one. And we are so incredibly happy for um, Pastor Andre and Julia, and we're, you know, I mean, I just think they're amazing, and what they're doing is amazing, and that they, they're going to be an amazing family. And they're traveling, for those of you who are visiting or don't know, they're traveling to the Ukraine, I think next week there is their leaving date. And that takes an incredible amount of preparation, and, um, it, you know, if you have a child, you know that after the birthday, your life completely changes, and I'm sure after adoption day, their life is completely changed. So the least that we could do was give three sermons and for me to be here. So I'm not complaining. I'm just explaining to you guys that. And also, um, I'm going to admit now, this, this is not easy, but I'm going to admit to the entire church that we have been doing a sermon series on Christ's Object Lessons, which is an incredible book, and most Adventists that have been raised in the church have read this book. I have not. I have not read Christ's Object uh, 
lessons cover to cover. I've heard portions of it, and I don't know why it is I haven't read it. Um, I think that's a shame. I am praying that I will read it. That this this sermon series has been a great opportunity to read it. So if you've been reading it, that's that's great. Um, I will tell you that I made this deal with David. This was the week he said would be best for me to give the sermon, and then I found out that the um, topics were part of the sermon series. They're pre-selected, and that my um, chapter was going to be forgiveness, the measure of forgiveness. So if you read, um, if you've been reading along with the sermon series, on page 100 is the measure of forgiveness. And I thought, wow, forgiveness, that's my assigned chapter. And so I start reading it, and it's like I recognized as soon as I start reading this chapter to prepare this sermon that God wanted, I'm here today because God wanted me to read this that God wanted me to pray about this and to digest this. And um, even in preparing the sermon, I probably haven't spent the amount of time that I should have uh, in his word reading this and reflecting on this. I don't know that I could spend enough time um, doing that. And so what I want you to know is that every single word that I'm speaking here to you today is not anything from me. It's not my incredible theological um, analysis of the measure of forgiveness. It's truly just God's revelation to me in my life. Um, And I'm honestly just, uh, this is a testimony to you of what this chapter has meant to me. I'm truly preaching to myself. Um, I believe that God desperately needed me to read this because my salvation depends on it. And so I um, am biased, but I think I was assigned the most important chapter of the book. So um, I don't have anything brilliant to impart to you. I am going to share with you my own experience with forgiveness, and I'm going to also extend to you an invitation to pray, to pray diligently that we allow this object lesson to leave us changed and to, that it challenges us to live differently. Um, This object lesson, I believe, has the power to change everything about my own life. It has the power to help me have better emotional health, have better relationships, and to help me with my stress levels. And I think it could do the same for you, I'm sure. And so I believe that's why I'm here today. And I pray that um, that you might receive some blessing from this chapter like I did. So I'm going to pray real quick, if you don't mind joining me. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit might come into this place, that it might flood us and flood this um, atmosphere, Lord. Um, we pray that we'll come before you humble, empty vessels, that you can fill us with your Spirit so that we can live in this world in an impossible way. Lord, I believe it is impossible to live the way you want us to in this world without you. I think you're the only thing um, that can make it possible for us to receive the challenge of forgiveness. And so I pray that right now we would empty ourselves of our own selves, empty ourselves of distractions, empty ourselves of anything that's not from you, and that we'd be filled, Lord, with your Holy Spirit, that we'd constantly um, be a cup that needed filling from you. In your name we pray. Amen. So forgiveness is a fundamental aspect of Christianity. If you're, you know, we claim that we are Christians. And um, Christianity is a unique religion when you look at the world religions because I don't believe there are any other religions that teach forgiveness the way that Christianity does. Um, Most other religions allow sacrifices to be made or, you know, certain actions to be taken or idols to be worshipped. There's money that you must pay to appease a pagan god and that will turn away their wrath. But in no other religion is the identity of the deity a savior. No other religion offers forgiveness or grace without giving, paying, or doing something. Only Christ offers mercy at no cost. Only Christ would come to earth. Only Christ would become subject to his own creations and then ultimately allow his creation to take his life. That's not new. That's not a new revelation. I'm sure you've heard something similar to that before. We're often called to to reflect upon the miracle of amazing grace, right? 
Amazing grace. But now I want you to consider not just amazing grace, but just consider Christ, who Jesus is, that he's a deity. He was the perfect son of God. He was prince of the Most High in Revelation. I recently did a Revelation Bible study, and it was like over and over again we would be called to reflect upon the fact that all of the universe, not just the world, but all of the universe is an eternal praise to God. They all are worshiping him. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And think about that, who he, he is, and what he gave up for us. He came to be beat. He came to be spat upon. So I was kind of just dwelling on that this week. And it was, this revelation came to my mind of an instance in my life, and it is the most random instance, but it's just an instance where someone had offended me. And I I believe that God put that in my mind in the middle of dwelling on him. And I know that many of you have probably endured a, a lot of things that are more difficult than I've endured in my life where someone's hurt you. You know, David and I, our whole careers ultimately are, are about the fact that people hurt people. And that's why there's the law. And that's why there's lawyers. Because either people hurt people physically or people hurt people emotionally. And then we work to help people who are hurting by other people. That's all, that, that's all the whole law is. And so there's a lot of hurt in this world, and I'm sure a lot of you have endured a lot of hurt. Some little things, some big things, some little things that became big things. Um, but just um, raise your hand, if you would, with me, when you can think of something that someone's done to hurt you. It doesn't have to be a big thing, a small thing. Just think of something that someone's done to hurt you and raise your hand when you think of it. I'm not going to ask you guys to share, so maybe more people will raise their hand. But When I'm reflecting on Jesus, it literally, it came into my mind within five seconds. And most of you raised your hands within five seconds. Five seconds for the majority of us to recall an offense that someone's done. And when I thought about it, the, the instance I was upset about, I remembered feeling indignant about the hurt that I had endured. And... I'll just give you a little um, summary of it. Basically, I had asked a person to give me a courtesy in a specific situation. When something happened, I would like them to do something. And this person ignored my request. I felt disrespected, and I felt like that person had violated a boundary. And so I took it upon myself to address them privately and personally, and I asked them, do not do that again. So these are all things you've heard before, right? Like boundary and addressing the person and communication, right? These are all good steps to healthy relationships. And the world tells us, yes, that's how you have to handle this situation. Does anybody think I handled it wrong? No, I was in the right. They were in the wrong. I addressed them. I um, told them not to do it again, how I felt, expressed my frustration. But that's not all I did. I steamed about it. I steamed about the offense that this person had had done. And I remember for an entire day being so upset, just completely angry. And I remember that my close friends and family, the people who call me regularly, they called me that day. And I took that opportunity every call to vent to them about how I was feeling. And during these venting sessions, I just bashed this person about how ridiculous this situation was and what they did and how wrong they were. And then after I had addressed the person, I felt like they weren't really sorry like they should have been. So I chose to harbor ill will against that person. So I addressed them. I told them what they did was wrong. I told them I wanted them to change their behavior in the future. And then I didn't really get the feeling that they were sorry. So I was like, man, they're just so ridiculous. Like, how can they not see this? And then I've just kind of kept that with me. So now, week, months later, I'm sitting here reflecting on Jesus. And all of a sudden, Jesus puts this situation in my mind. And I really feel like he was trying to speak with me um, about how what I'm doing, holding on to this, is not a good thing. And I have an excellent memory. I don't always remember names very well. But I remember faces, I remember people, and I remember events, like things and things people have said. It just stays with me. And um, it can be a good thing. It can also be a very bad thing. And when um, I'm hurt, it's not like I file it away 
necessarily like way back like David has a bad memory he cannot for, I mean he can't remember things I feel like I'm always reminding him of stuff and he's like what and I'm like yes that happened you did this and you know I just it's right there 15 seconds I can recall it. it's just like right there anyway it's so it's it's a good thing it can be a bad thing but anyway um it, it takes me not a long time to remember the things people have done to hurt me or um I'm I'm often in a situation where I'll remind myself why I avoid someone or I'll justify why I, I don't like the company of certain people. Um, and I'll, I, David's probably heard me say this a million times. I've forgiven them. I just don't trust them anymore. So that's kind of the go-to pity line that I use myself. You know, it's like, well, they hurt me. Remember, they did this. So, And that's just kind of been the way I've operated for, for most of my life. And I'm just one of billions of people on the earth. But can you think about all the people ever in the history of earth? Think of the people who existed before Christ and the people after Christ. Jesus tells us that he knows everyone's inmost beings, that he knew them in their mother's womb. He knew the people who spat on him at the crucifixion. He knew intimately the names of the voices of the people that he heard jeering at him from the crowd. He knew the people calling for his crucifixion. He knows me. He knows you. He knows all of those who use his name casually and in vain. He knows those who claim his name but don't apply his words. He knows every sin that every individual has ever committed. He knows all of it. You know, like I feel the need to keep this record in my mind of the things that people have done and remind people, oh, that person hurt me by doing this, that, and the other. Jesus knows that. I don't know why I feel like I need to be the backup system, but he's got it. He knows it. He knows what happened. I don't need to do this. And um, I'm just amazed at, at the recognition that he, how much he knows and who he is. Do we, I mean, we know Jesus isn't there as the prosecutor standing to convict us. He's not there in front of God calling for us to receive our just reward. He's not there saying, give them what they deserve. He's not calling for eternal destruction and obliteration. His words were, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's our God. That's who we worship. That's who the king of the universe is. And so from this, where I've gone so far in this sermon, you, you could probably tell that I struggle with forgiveness. And I'm going to share with you, I also struggle with blessed assurance. And I believe, I, I've kind of created this theory, I believe that those who struggle with forgiveness oftentimes struggle with the idea of blessed assurance. And I think those two concepts go hand in hand. I think that if you cannot fully accept grace, that often you are not able to fully forgive those uh, in your life who have wronged you. And that's kind of the revelation I, I took away from the chapter, The Measure of Forgiveness. This, this small idea just kind of was highlighted to me. So in, if you've read the chapter, you know that this is based on the parable in Matthew 18. So if you don't mind turning with me to Matthew 18. Verse 23, we're just going to start at verse 23. I'm reading from the New NIV uh, Bible, um, but you can just kind of follow along. In verse 23 it says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement... A man who owed him 10,000 talents, and my Bible had like a footnote, and that footnote told me that 10,000 talents is, a mil is millions of dollars nowadays, was brought to him. So a man owes him millions of dollars. He's brought to him. Since the man was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. So he wasn't given an extension. The debt was canceled. 
So let's think about two facts here. Um, one, that the debt was canceled. And two, think about what the consequence of the debt was. The consequence of the debt was he, his wife, and their children, everything they owned, to be sold. They were being sold into slavery. Now, David and I have had a goal to live debt-free um, since we were married. And it's not easy. Um, we actually graduated with quite a bit of student loans. And I really couldn't appreciate graduation. I literally remember sitting at graduation being like, wow, I'm graduating. I'm finally done with school. And I'm sitting there thinking, I really hope I get a good job because this is a lot of debt. I mean, it's a burden on, on a person. Um, and so I'm guessing that many of you have had loans of one kind or another, and you know that owing money is, is a burden. But just think, in modern-day America, the loans that you owed for cars, for houses, student loans. If you never even make one payment, um, you might get a lien, or there might be like financial red tape, or a poor credit score. But none of us, we're not facing debtor's prison if we don't pay our student loans back. You know, we're not, we're not going to go and be sold into slavery. Um, but this man here in this story, he had a, a big loan, and that's what he was facing. He was facing slavery. And it was for millions of dollars, and his master took pity and canceled the debt. So let's read the next words in verse 28. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. I didn't know how much a hundred denarii was, but my Bible has a footnote, and the footnote says that is a few dollars. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Wow. He was just, a million-dollar loan was canceled, and he no longer has to be sold. His children don't have to be slaves. He should have been celebrating. He should have been relieved. He should have been rejoicing. But here's my theory. I think he didn't really believe his master. I think he didn't believe him that the debt was canceled. It's, in, it's inconceivable that he would go out and find someone who owed him a couple of dollars, that he would be that desperate for a couple of dollars after he was just forgiven a million-dollar owe. I don't think he had blessed assurance. I don't think he believed in grace. And so he violently went out, found this person, and demanded the money. He had not claimed the mercy that, he'd been, that he had been given. In Jesus' parable in verse 31, if you all keep following with me, it says, When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that happened. Obviously, they were distressed. This is a, a distressing parable. You know, I know um, quite a few people in the community who aren't necessarily religious. And yet, I'm telling you, if I read this parable to most of them, they would, they would be shocked, and they would not have done, in this kind of circumstance, what the unmerciful servant did. Um, I know for a fact that none of you sitting here today would have acted like that. I know for a fact that if you had been forgiven uh, millions of dollars loans, that you would not be upset about a couple dollars. I mean, this is just like a very, very wretched servant, a despicable person. And it's inconsistent with any conceivable idea of justice. I think that even the members of our Congress would agree that what this unmerciful servant did was wrong. They would actually agree on that. So the truth is, though, as horrible as this is, and it's, it, you know, I think everyone who hears it is like, that's wrong, right? The truth is, this is me. This is you. This is what happens when Christians who have accepted grace get upset with their sisters and brothers about trite things. We get violent. We want to choke that person. We demand righteousness. This is us when we claim the blood of Jesus but take offense from other people, from other human beings. And so Jesus used this parable to demonstrate to me 
my own actions. And every detail of it is so true. It applies to the hypocrisy in my own heart. Because I pray every single day that God forgives me of my sins. That he would have mercy on me and my family and save us. Save us from what we have earned for ourselves. What we have chosen. Save me from the sin that I choose over righteousness. Save me from the fact that I have allowed the world and the temptations of it to lead me away from my creator. When I betray Christ for my own selfish desires, I have elected to partake in the wages of sin. I have chosen to die eternally. But Jesus paid it all. I don't think we spend enough time considering what Jesus has saved us from. We say, oh, I'm saved. He saved me. I'm saved. We're not saved from inconvenience. We're not saved from suffering. We're not saved from trite problems in our modern world. We are saved from eternal damnation. He's offering us living water, eternal life, and that's huge. He's offering us what everyone in the whole world is out there seeking. I listened to a um, clip on the radio and it was, David knows the, the term, I've never heard this word before, but it's basically, um, there's people out there paying a lot of money to freeze their corpse um, in the hopes that someday there will be a medical breakthrough and they will be unfrozen and they will do this medical thing and they will be able to live forever, you know, at a future time. I don't remember what, it, it, people have been trying to do it for years, but it's, it's a new movement. People are still trying to do it. And we don't have to do that. They, they, it costs a lot of money to do that. We don't have to desperately save every dollar we have to preserve our own decaying bodies and the bodies of those we love so that we could be awakened in the future to a life in a world that's still filled with suffering in a life that's still, still filled with trials. We have the promise of eternal life in paradise. We have the promise of eternal life with a God who knows what it was like to live on this earth with the God who created us. He still chose to, for us to live here. He chose for, to die for us. And he was, the, this is just amazing. When he was on earth, he was a God who, although he didn't have riches or wealth or anything to his name, people were drawn to him. He's a good, good father. People want to be near him and we get eternity with him. He's a loving king. He taught us all those years ago, and we have these words in the Bible that continue to guide us. And that's who we get to spend eternity with. And it's incredible when you focus on this, when you think of him, all he gave up for us, when you think of what grace is and what it offers us, and the abundant goodness that we have, it makes you or makes me feel ashamed because I'm an unmerciful servant, and he forgives me time and time again for big things, for being unfaithful to him, for leaving, you know, I was raised knowing the word and knowing how to act, and yet I still sin. I'm still out there sinning. He forgives me for using harsh words when a gentle word could have turned away wrath between me and other children of God. And then I'm out there remembering all these trivial offenses and their pocket change for what he's had to forgive me for. So I'm working on this and thinking about how good he is, and it brought me to Psalms 103. And I invite you to turn there with me, because it is just, um, it was the words, I I, I really believe he led me there, because I couldn't put into words um, how I was feeling about him at the time. And when I um, looked up different versions of Psalms 103, I found the International Standard Version, and I just really like the way these words are in Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, and never forget any of his benefits. He continues to forgive all your sins. He continues to heal all your diseases. And he continues to redeem your life from the pit. And he continuously surrounds you with gracious love and compassion. He keeps satisfying you with good things. And he keeps renewing your youth like the eagles. The Lord continuously does what is right, executing justice for all who are being oppressed. He revealed his plans to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. And this was the part 
that I really loved. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, patient and abundantly rich in gracious love. He does not maintain a dispute continuously or remain angry for all time. He neither deals with us, he neither deals with me according to my sins, nor repays me equivalent to my iniquity. As high as heaven rises above earth, so his gracious love strengthens those who fear him. You know, we don't even know how big the universe is. Like scientists don't, they don't know how to quantify it. That they would agree would be eternal almost. And that's what he's saying, eternally high, as high as heaven rises above earth, so his gracious love strengthens us, those who fear him. As distant as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our sins from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. Now I'd ask you to remember why it was you raised your hand earlier. Think back to who it was you thought of and what it was they did to wrong you. He neither deals with us according to our sins nor repays us equivalent to our iniquity. When I read these words, I am left feeling defeated, ashamed, and humiliated. Why do the offenses of others incite my anger? Why am I slow to offer forgiveness? Why am I slow to offer mercy? Miss Ledbetter once gave an amazing sermon that um, something she said in that sermon stuck with me, and I probably won't say it as well as she did, and I don't think she's here anymore so or is here today. So um, she can't correct me <laughs> or say it. I was going to ask her to say it if I said it wrong, but basically she said in this sermon that we are often offended by others or upset by the words and actions of others because of pride, because of our own pride. In other words, someone does something to me and my pride incites me to feel like, how, so, how dare that person treat me like that? Um, I don't deserve that and I won't tolerate it. That's what our pride does. That's why I feel hurt when somebody does or says something to upset me. And I believe that that pride often also comes with a healthy dose of self-pity. And I've learned, I'm growing to recognize self-pity in my own life, that it's a, a bad feeling that I really enjoy. Um, in fact, I nourish it. And I think um, a lot of people don't perceive self-pity. I think I overlooked it in my life because when you think of the word self-pity or someone feels sorry for themselves, don't you kind of always imagine someone who's like gloom and doom and woe is me? And I'm a pretty positive person all the time. You know, I say hi and I smile and I'm somewhat productive. You know, I'm not just like sitting there like, oh, you know, so I think people wouldn't think that I have self-pity for myself. And I think I thought I didn't have self-pity for myself because I was like, well, I'm not, you know, like that. But I have learned to recognize it in my life. Basically, someone hurts me and I feel offended and then I feel sorry for myself. I'm like, I didn't deserve that. Poor me. And I use self-pity like this big, warm blanket. Like if I could picture it, it's like this blanket and I try to bandage wounds with it. Like I just hold it really close and tight and I don't want anybody or anything to come near the wound and try to clean it or fix it or anything. I just want to hold on to it. And it feels good. The blanket feels good. It feels nice to comfort myself with self-pity. And I don't want to let go of it. But it's a lie. It's fake. I can't comfort myself. God's supposed to be comforting me. And not only that, but I can't heal from these wounds because I'm covering them and I'm holding on to them and I'm trying to fix them myself. And I cannot heal them because I'm not really ready to forgive. Because allowing God to heal me, he's going to ask me to forgive the wound. And to forgive it is going to hurt. It's going to be letting go of this blanket. It's going to be letting go of re remembering it. It's not, it means I can't remind anyone of the hurt I've endured anymore. I can't bring it up and say, oh, this happened to me. So I can't do that anymore. And it's also going to require humility. When we accept the wounds that we've received, as Christ accepted the crown of thorns, as Christ accepted the spit, and the mocking, and the beating, and the cross, and the nails in his hands. When we accept our own wounds, 
It requires humility. It requires becoming less that he might become more. Humility is a big deal. In my Christian experience, I have not focused on humility. I don't I think as a young child, I remember hearing it and wondering about it and trying to define it in my own mind. And I didn't really have a clear grasp on it. And so for whatever reason, to this day, when I hear the word humble, I think of Moses and John the Baptist. I don't know why that is, but somebody must have tried describing them as humble. I think that with Moses, I I hear, remove your shoes for you're standing on holy ground. And I think, oh, that's humility. And then um, with John the Baptist, you know, he didn't really have clothes. He only ate honey. He ate bugs. And that's pretty much what I think of when I hear John the Baptist. Um, I like shoes. I like wearing shoes. I don't like bugs. I will not eat them. David recently ate two bugs, but that's besides the point. You can ask him about it. I'm sure he'd love to tell you about it. I would really not like living like John the Baptist. And so I often felt like I'm not humble. I'm not that person. I'm not able to be John the Baptist. And so I'm not him. And so I feel like it's beyond my grasp. It's something I can't attain on my own. I fail at. And so I don't like to focus on it or think about it. You know, it's like the the parts of Christianity you're good at, like being kind. I'm good at telling my daughter stories about let's be kind because, but I never tell her stories like let's be humble because I don't really have a good grasp on it, you know? And so um, I don't know if any of you have ever felt like that, but it was a two years ago that someone explained to me the Sermon on the Mount. And that was a really big revelation in my Christian experience because up until that point, I heard things like, blessed are the meek and the poor in spirit. And I certainly wasn't raised in wealth. I wasn't born into privilege or anything. Um, But I was born an American, and um, my parents always taught me to be grateful for that, that we were born in a country with incredible um, opportunity and resources. And so growing up, my, my parents, both their parents, didn't have a lot, and they, they were in poverty. And so we were just always raised like, you know, um, it could be so much worse. And so that's just kind of stuck with me. And so even now, in good times and hard times, I'm like, someone always has it worse. And that's true for all of you today. I don't know what all of your circumstances are, but someone always has it worse. So then I always felt like, well, there's always somebody more meek than me. I mean, that's more, you know, I mean, that's just the way I thought of it. And so I thought, I wonder if Jesus even really likes me because I'm not poor in spirit. I don't think I'm not meek. I actually have a strong will. So I just kind of never felt like I was in the club of people that Jesus would like. And then someone explained to me the truth behind the Sermon on the Mount. And it was a huge deal to me. Um, If you want to turn to Matthew 5, I'm just going to go through it quickly. But the Sermon on the Mount, I learned it's not about your clothes. It's not about your shoes or whether you eat bugs, I'm sorry, or whether you eat pasta. It's about the fact of your heart. It's about... um, It's about what we're doing here today. When we sit here today and recognize I'm that unmerciful servant, when we sit here and recognize we are nothing, we are, all that we are is worse than nothing. We're like wretched rags. Anything that we do, anything I do, is like not good in any way. Any any good in me is of him. Any worth of me, anything I am worth or I do well in this, in this world while I'm on life, or while I have life, anything that's good, any goodness in me is all because of him. It's all because of God. It's because of his spirit within me. This is being poor in spirit, recognizing we are nothing without him, recognizing our goodness is not of ourselves. Literally, we are not able to accept his grace on our own. It is because of him and his spirit within us that we even can accept the gift of salvation. This is being poor in spirit. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, mourning, this, being able to raise our hands and saying, I have failed to give mercy. I have been a despicable servant. 
I have partaken in pride and sin and I have fallen short and I am a sinner. When we mourn our own human condition, he says, they will be comforted. We will be blessed. That blessing doesn't have to do with, you know, we say, Lord, bless me. You know, doesn't have to do with not being sick or being healed or having what you want or getting good things. It has to do with an internal thriving, no matter what's going on in the world around us, thriving in our circumstances. He says, blessed are you who mourn, for you will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The meek, when we are convicted by parables in Christ's object lessons, when we recognize and are ashamed of our own actions, when we turn our mind to God, then we are meek before him. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. When we recognize that you are stuck being an unmerciful servant without him, we are stuck being that guy until we take in the Holy Spirit. You cannot accomplish forgiveness. I do not believe you can accomplish forgiveness without Jesus Christ. You cannot accomplish it without him. You must hunger and thirst for him, for righteousness. And then he promises you will be filled. When we recognize giving mercy as generously as our own master is not a loss on our part, but just a portion of all that we have been forgiven, and we crave the righteous heart to be able to do that, basically he will he promises us to fill us with his own spirit. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That is the lesson of this chapter. And then if you'll continue with me, he talks about blessed are the pure in heart. And verse 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And this stuck with me as I'm reviewing this and putting it together. I thought I was going to stop at the part that said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. But I, I continued to verse 9, and it says, Blessed are the peacemakers. And it hit me that often when we give forgiveness freely, we become that. We become a peacemaker. When you offer someone forgiveness freely, you restore peace if you're doing it right. If you're forgiving someone the way Jesus wants you to, you will restore peace. We will become peacemakers when we are able to truly forgive. I believe someone with a truly forgiving spirit is able to walk through life giving grace, giving mercy freely. And so I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking of all that means in my own life, of how that would change my world, the world around me, how it would change my, ha my family, how it would change my relationships with people. And God gave me this, and this is specifically for me. I don't know um, if it is really, if he's speaking to any one of you, but he spoke to me this way. And he, um, many of you may have already come to this revelation, and that's great. Um, but when I thought about that, walking through life, freely giving grace, I thought, this is what the world needs today. And this is not a political message, but many of you probably know that I have a strong op political opinion. If you've been my Facebook friend for any period of time, you will also know that my political opinion is not a secret. I, I share it freely. And um, then God gave me a unique opportunity. He has set before, I believe, you know, things have happened, and now I find myself in a place where neither a candidate really embodies what I believe in. And so I don't know if all of that happened just for me, but I think God's using that, uh, that, this experience for me for a reason because in this experience, I, have, I will admit to you that I now have felt led to sit and listen. I'm not no longer screaming my opinion. I'm just listening and I'm hearing for the first time, I think, what the people around me in this world are saying. And I'm listening to all the arguments now on all the issues. Some issues I care very much about, I have for a long time, but I'm just listening, listening to opposing positions. And I've discovered, this has been my discovery, um, that w after sitting and listening, I now believe on both sides of the aisle, 50% of the people are right 50% of the time. So in other words, neither side is entirely right on anything. And yet we're stuck, our country's stuck in this situation of everything being split in half 
everyone's at opposition with everyone, basically. And this is not a political message, but I'm just telling you, when it, something happens in the news, I don't know if many of you know this, but my undergraduate degree was in journalism. And I now go on the computer and I look up the article from one news source. And then as soon as I finish reading that article, I go and look up another news source to hear the other side. And this is something I believed in journalism. But I'm telling you, I read these stories. I have to read two different sources in order to feel like I got the full picture of what happened because even our media is very partisan. There is no journalistic integrity, I don't believe, anymore. So it's not just what's happening. It's not just the people. It's even the people telling us about what the people are saying that is partisan and is at, at, at odds with each other. And everyone, it seems like, out there has very strong opinions that they voice very freely with so much conviction. If it's not a Facebook status, it's a bumper sticker. I mean, literally, I'm just driving my daughter places, running errands, and we literally drive around with our opinions pasted to our cars. <laughs> and it's just, but think about it. I mean, issues like the right to carry a gun, the right to, like, carry a pregnancy, the right to pray in school. Some stickers are just name calling. Do you really think that these people believe that one line on a sticker on your car will change anyone's mind about something like the conflict in the Middle East? But we do it, right? We just stick our opinion out there. And it's just going to offend people. That's all that we're doing is just offending people all the time. And so I, I feel like I just kind of went off on a tangent, but I'm telling you that I do have Christian brethren. I, I have relationships with Christian people on both sides of these issues that are very loyal to their political positions, but are also very devout Christians. And I respect them. And I know it's hard to believe this, but they are. They're, they're on both sides of the aisle. And it's okay. I think it's, it's our role today as Christians is to be focused on being peacekeepers more than focusing on changing people's minds. I think our role as Christians needs to be about restoring peace in our community. That has not been my goal, you know, all this time. It's been more about changing people's minds. I'm confessing that to you. But I received this message from this study, and um, I think it, it, it's, a powerful, it's a powerful goal for us to have, and I think it could be life-changing. I think that our role as Christians is a person who can hold their convictions without despising those who disagree. I think a Christian in today's world needs to be someone who can literally walk around forgiving everyone around us, forgiving what they see pasted to a car, forgiving angry comments they read on Facebook, forgiving the yard, the signs in their neighbor's yard, just freely, abundantly walking around giving grace recognizing this world is hurting, this world is in pain, recognizing the sin that we're falling into every day and just saying, you know what, Christ died for that person. He loves that person. I forgive that person. Jesus warned us. We know this. We have revelation. He warned us. This earth is not going to last. No one on either side of these issues has the power to save this earth because it will be destroyed. I believe that the words that Jesus gave us are true. I believe the world will be destroyed with a national deficit, without a national deficit. The world will be destroyed with gun rights and it will be destroyed without gun rights. It is going to end. The world is going to end. Jesus is coming back and I'm here, standing here, telling you this and telling you what is our role? How do we apply this lesson to us in this world? And I think that's it. It's, it's, it and it's an international thing. You know, David told us about um, the, in England, I mean, Europe feels like it's falling apart. England feels split. It's happening in Latin America. It's happening in the Middle East. And I think as a group, as a Christian, we should be clear that our role is peacemakers. And we need to embrace that role. Um, we need to embrace the fact that we are lighthouses. We need to embrace the fact that we are salt on the earth and what that is. I think that that salt is grace. It's forgiveness. 
We don't hold a grudge. We're Christians. I don't recall things that people do against me in 15 seconds anymore. I'm just forgiving them. If we can do that, if we can have forgiving hearts, if we can show people what it looks like to be filled with the abundant love of God, if we can be slow to anger, they will see Jesus. They will see patience. They will see his kindness. And we need him to do that. We need him to come into us, to be able to see people not as enemies, but as children, as children of God. He wants them. He wants all these people, all of them out there. You know, you think of, oh, those people are bad, or those people are bad. He wants those people. There is no time for bitterness anymore. There's no room in our hearts for ill will. Not for people running for office. Not for strangers with offensive bumper stickers. Not for our rude relatives. Not for inconsiderate church members. We don't have room to harbor these feelings. So I'm going to end now. If you read the study, um, if you could turn to it, we're going to go to page 103. And I'm going to start at the um, first full paragraph on page 103. And I'm just going to share with you my favorite part of the lesson. We ourselves, according to the author of this book, owe everything to God's free grace. Grace in the covenant ordained our adoption. Grace in the Savior affected our redemption, our regeneration, and our exaltation to heirship with Christ. Let this grace be revealed to others. Give the erring one no occasion for discouragement. Suffer not a pharisaical hardness to come in and hurt your brother. Let no bitter sneer rise in mind or heart. Let no tinge of scorn be manifest in the voice. If you speak a word of your own, if you take an attitude of indifference or show suspicion or distrust, it may prove the ruin of a soul. He needs a brother with the elder brother's heart of sympathy to touch his heart of humanity. Let him feel the strong clasp of a sympathizing hand and hear the whisper, let us pray. God will give a rich experience to you both. Prayer unites us with one another and with God. Prayer brings Jesus to our side and gives to the fainting, perplexed soul new strength to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Prayer turns aside the attacks of Satan. When one turns away from human intentions to behold Jesus, this was um, probably what well, I pray I will daily apply is turning away from human imperfections to behold Jesus. A divine transformation takes place in the character. The spirit of Christ working upon the heart conforms it to his image. Then let it be your effort to lift up Jesus. Let the mind's eye be directed to the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. As you engage in this work, remember that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful towards others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. In God's forgiveness, the heart of the erring one is drawn close to the great heart of infinite love. The tide of divine compassion flows into the sinner's soul and from him to the souls of others. The tenderness and mercy that Christ has revealed in his own precious life will be seen in those who become sharers of his grace. But if any man have not the spirit of Christ, 